Our Old Testament lesson comes today from Ecclesiastes. Words that may seem very familiar and to those of a certain age may even carry a musical tune in your head as I read it. Listen for the Word of God. The words of the teacher, the son of David, the king of Jer in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Round and round goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they continue to flow. All things are wearisome, more than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new. It has already been in the ages before us. The people of long ago are not remembered, nor will there be any remembrance of people yet to come by those who come after them. And listen to this word from the third chapter of Colossians, beginning at the first verse. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. But Christ is all and in all. May God bless to us the reading of this word. And let the people say, These are two very different passages, uh, but they both speak to the heart of the same issue. Um, and one in a 
somewhat lighthearted and rather mocking tone, the other in a much more serious, but at the same time more hopeful tone. The writer of the epistle concerns himself with a very practical matter for all Christians. The last time I was here, we talked about Colossians and the particular problem that they had with all of the competing variety of religions that were around them and the culture that was enticing them on every side. Um, And you can almost hear in the preface to this chapter that that the writer hears from them the response, okay, so you've told us what we shouldn't do. You've told us what the problem is. You have told us who God is. You have told us about keeping faithful to Christ and the clarity of that message which (coughs) was in Christ. We got all that. So now what? How are we supposed to live in all of this mess that you have dumped us into? That you say God has put us there for a reason. So what reason is it? Help us understand how is it that we should live now that we have a picture of where we live and in what context we live in this place. And so the writer of Colossians is kind of helping them find their way along. And one of the beautiful things about this passage, this happens to be one of my favorite passages in the epistles, um, and maybe not for the things that people may think, but it really, in many ways, is really very beautiful. Because here you have a writer who is giving people a vision of life and a vision of the consequence of that life which is neither a promise of pie in the sky in the by and by but nor is it a marching order to go out and deliberately sacrifice themselves for the cause and abandon all their other responsibilities. Because if you listen closely to what he's saying, he's saying, Here's the truth. The world is there, and yes, you have to live in the world, but you don't have to behave like the world. You don't have to be like the Romans. You don't have to be like the Greeks. You don't have to be like the Scythians. You don't have to be like these folks whose reality is might makes right And so you want to gather as much firepower, money, friends, influence as you can in order to negotiate your way in the world. In another lifetime, I read Roman history. And I read Roman biographies. And and they are, it's fascinating stuff if you're in that mood. Um, Because in Rome, the way you made yourself in the wor- in, through the world was that you, you could brag about who your friends were. You could brag about who you had over for a feast or a banquet last week. You could, in essence, the idea of influence peddling was taken not just to a value but to an art form in Rome. Because who you were in the community and what your influence was and how much power you had was completely dependent upon this kind of network. You know, Facebook thought it invented something. They should go back and read Pliny. Um, uh, It was the network of friends and the ability to do things that gave you power. And the people in Colossae are confronted with the reality of, okay, how do we even survive in this world if we're being told by Paul that we shouldn't lie, cheat, steal, um, uh, go have sex with the temple goddesses, um, you know, all of the things that were common currency 
for the culture at that time, they were being told, don't do that. And so, Paul's response to them is to say, it is not the presence of these thing, of anything in particular by which you will be known, but rather the absence. You get that? It is not that I'm telling you how to live your life as it is I'm trying to help you understand that to live the Christian life is to live it almost in secret. As you go about your daily life, people will know and know that you are a Christian not because you are there with Christ in their face every minute of the day, but you will be known because you are different from those who do practice fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. And then there's the second list that really is even more important. You know, those are really things that if you, if you watch yourself, you can not even be around those things. And then it's really easy not to do. But the other things, anger, wrath, Malice, slander, and abusive language. I don't know how in any, in any context of any culture that you are able to avoid the temptation to those things. And if you've got an answer for that, please let me know. I mean, aside from going to a monastery and living in a cell by yourself, and even then it probably isn't going to be that easy. I mean, even Thomas Merton, who was probably one of the people of the 20th century who worked hardest at practicing the virtues of the gospel, was given to outbursts. Um, and indeed, the great irony of his life is that the thing that probably killed him in a monastery was that he was irritated at the placement of a fan in his cubicle when he was trying to sleep and it had a frayed wire on it, and when he got up to move it, he stepped on the live wire. So it is the absence of these things. And the absence where it says, do not lie to one another. I don't know how many times I have found myself in the position especially in doing church work where I'm confronted with the, the need to look at someone and say, I'm not going to make a comment. And then when pressed, I would have to say, I'm not going to tell you because I don't want to lie to you. Which changes the conversation. There's a certain amount of respect when you own what you can't do. But there's also this aspect where Paul is talking about a life hidden away in Christ. It is not only the absence of these things, but it is living and appreciating and putting what we care about, what we love, what we own as being a gift of God, not out there, but in here and in Christ. And I can give you some examples. I had a friend in, um, in North Carolina many years ago who, as it happens, helped me with a situation. She was um, uh, a, uh, a person, uh, her husband was uh, in business, and she was an office worker, and she had lived a very simple not, not frugal necessarily, but very simple life and had very simple tastes and, and, but was well read, knew a lot about the world, was always engaged in other people and she was an extremely active person in the women of the church uh, and Presbyterian women. And the thing that she used to do, which I found absolutely extraordinary, was that she cut this deal with her husband. 
who was not particularly religious, but you know, he would say, okay, you can you go to church and you be active and you go on all those trips and I will support you and I will love you and I will pray with you at night, but I'm not going to church every Sunday. That's just not in me. But you can do whatever you want to. And what's more, whatever you earn, that is your money. That's not going to the household accounts. It's not going to support. I will support us. You do with that money whatever you want to. And she did. But no one ever knew it unless you were a recipient. And once she helped me with a project that I needed some money for, it wasn't a church project, it was a kind of a personal project, and the way that I found out about her life hidden away in Christ was that I needed some help, and somebody told her. And she came to me and she said, so how much do you need? And I told her, and it was an astronomical amount for me, and she said, okay, so what I will ask you to do is I will ask you, you know, I will loan you that money and you'll have four years to pay it back. And you can pay it back in chunks, you can pay it back monthly, you can do whatever you want, you know, but in four years I'm going to need that money for somebody else. And I was dumbfounded. I looked at her and I said, how, how is this possible? And she's, then she tells me the story about the deal with her husband. And she tells me the story about how she's been helping people through her entire life do what God has called them to do. She bumped into a young man in, um, in Montreat at the Presbyterian Women's Conference uh, who had come to speak and to talk about his dream that you know one day he would uh, be able to go to medical school. And she pulled him aside after the speech and she talked to him a little bit and she said, well now, are your grades good enough? Oh yes, I have all excellent marks in all of my studies. And do you have a medical school that's willing to admit you? Oh yes, they are, they are holding a place for me at this fine medical school in England, but, um, but I can't go until I can prove that I can support myself and pay the tuition. And she says, okay, well who do I write to? And he does a double take. And then so she shares the short story with him about how well, she supported him for 10 years to get his medical degree and to be able to go home to Bangladesh to be a doctor. And I asked her once as we were finally settling up my accounts, I looked at her and I said, how do you do this? And she says, well, I have three very simple principles. Number one, it has to be to help somebody with their calling from God to develop their gifts. Okay, I got that. And she said, number two, I don't tell anybody. The only way you know this story is by my helping you enable your gifts from God. And she said, number three, I don't tell my husband. She said, we are joint heirs in my secret life in Christ. You know, we, we all can't do that. But the truth is, we all can put our treasure in Christ in the simple, gracious ways that we treat one another and in the way that we enable others it doesn't even have to be money. It can be encouragement. You have a gorgeous gift in music. And may God bless you to pursue that. Because it truly is a gift. One that is completely lost on me. And if you've ever been close enough to listen to me sing, you know how true that is. We have people in this congregation who have wonderful gifts in teaching, in helping others, in making it possible for things to move forward. 
you know, too often we look at the, you know, we look at, at two things that just, they always mystify me. On the one hand, we look at the arts as a luxury. Now we're finding out that music, art, drama are the, the most important ways, that I'll say that again, the most important ways that we learn mathematics, geometry, are you following me? Art is the foundation of science. There was a person on TED Talks about two weeks ago who talks about how learning music is how they develop the understanding of calculus. And that that remains true today. If we want to do higher math, if you can't do music, you should find something else to be interested in. So on that end, we, we have the high, what we consider the higher cultural aspects of our lives. You know, kind of the dessert at the end of the meal. When really, it's the meat and potatoes. And then on the other thing, we have the, the what I would call the discounting of, of the ordinary. The administrative tasks, the cleaning up tasks, the ordering tasks that way too many of us get involved in. And now we're being told by business management professionals who are telling us that is the high art of business. You know, I had somebody this week say, oh, I told them what I did, and they said, oh, well, you're a church bureaucrat. As I was, that was something to be ashamed of, you know, and asked, well, are you still a minister? And I said, yes. I preach twice a month up in Jaredstown. Oh, really? As though if I could do this administrative things and try to keep things straight with people, that I couldn't do the preaching part. You know, you don't value administrative work enough until you run into bad administration. It's kind of like this passage from Paul. It isn't the presence of that skill to move things along and do things orderly and to do things honestly and to do things without messing them up that gets noticed until it's messed up and then you wonder how we got in this mess. Years ago, too many years, before my time even, there was a movie that's been shown over and over and over again called It's a Wonderful Life. And there's an angel in the movie, his name's Clarence. And he says that every time a bell rings, an angel gets their wings. Well, I'd like to alter that just a little bit. It's not about the ringing of bells. It's about when we do things that are, in essence, the advancing of the kingdom, of keeping fidelity with our calling, with with being kind and gracious and pouring ourselves out for others in the same way that Christ poured himself out for us, that a bell rings in heaven. That's what Paul is trying to share with us. Live your life. Live your life in Christ even though you have to live it in the world. And let all that dross, let all of that cacophony of awful stuff, you know, swirl around but not touch you. Let it, let it be there, but don't give in to the madness of anger. Don't give in to the cruelty of self-centeredness. Don't give in to that life that is so afraid so concerned about one's own life and so self-consumed that we miss the gift that God has given us to begin with. Life 
in abundance. Life joyously lived. Life that enriches our spirit. It's really pretty simple. Do good, don't do bad. Say good things and be thankful for what we have. For the truth is, we have more than anyone has ever had in history before. Do good. Don't do bad. Use what we have for good, not just to build up an idol for ourselves. Because the God who calls us into service wants us to enjoy the results of doing the good news in this world. In a way, you might say that it's not lion versus Christians anymore, but Christians for the world. And that's the good news that I came to bring you.